Hey, did did you kind of did did you notice what we did just now? What we, we have watched Sinombre and we are talking about it and not talking about Marvel Escape shit. So, mm-hmm. you know, hello, film critics, take notice of us. We also have prestige here. Much criticism, much talk. Yeah. Shots are seen. Yeah. Finnish film criticism. Good talk. Good talk. <laughs> Cero ocho cinco 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 cero uno ocho siete. Otra vez. Nueve cero ocho. And it turns out that you actually leaked someone's real phone number out just now. It's the number to call if you are a mentally disturbed and tired podcast host. Yeah, I I, I can just you know wait and expect with with anxious and horror the coming lawsuits when. Turns out that somebody actually does own that phone number, and we have just encouraged harassment. Nothing to do with us. Today's film, Henrik, happens to be sin nombre. They tried to keep the politics out of the movie, but we won't be as successful in the lab. Think as usual. If anything is to go by from the past. Uh, Yup. Yup. I would also say that they really didn't manage to keep the politics out of the film. No. Oh. Looking forward to this explanation. Or expanding on this. But yeah, let, let me guess. Let me guess why why it's sin nombre today. Mm-hmm. I, I'm guessing you were hyped as all hell to finally go and see that new Bond movie. What What, what is the name? Uh, no time to die. Too busy to in die. In theaters, as we, as we had been planning to do. And then you have just noticed that it's been... Uh, MGM is currently trying to dump it on streaming services. And now we are quickly compensating by taking another Fukunaga feature. Actually, when I was looking for Latin American films... Well, this is a shot in Mexico and it's uh, partly a US production, yeah... But when I was looking for films, uh, Sin Nombre was com- consistently on different kinds of top lists of movies. And I got kind of got kind of intrigued about it with the nice poster and all. And it seemed like an interesting idea to delve in the, in the lab. And only like a long time later, I noticed that, oh, this is actually directed by Mr. Kari Joji Fukunaga. And then the kind of the lights aligned, of course. It's it's not a bad thing that we're looking at this director <laughs> <laughs> at the same time. But yeah, I'm Kari, and uh, he's Henrik, in case you didn't know. Welcome to the Flick Lab. Uh, this is the kind of show where we do too many goddamn episodes per week. And this is unhealthy, as you can probably hear for your entertainment. Yeah, the, the, the past week has been pretty grueling. What happened? Do we have any choosy stories cool. of how, in what way Henrik is completely out of oxygen today? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know if, if you happen to notice, but there, there has been like a major, major IT security leak in, in Finland. Also involving you? Which, well, not, not directly, thank God. Mm. But people I know, people I know. Same Some here. Some of them may be in, in bit, bit hazy waters at the moment. Yeah, same here. It's unbelievable that this kind of a leak could have happened. Yeah, there was a privately owned medical care company who had, in a great effort, uh, decrypted all the files related to patient data. No, actually, it was just on some goddamn computer to which anyone could have logged, just by typing kind of, if they know the Windows or the operating system password, they can just basically take the file and just just upload all of them to the internet, just like that. Yeah, and what 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 the, the rumor that has been going on in the in the dark web surrounding the situation is that 
the original hacker didn't even know the password. He just, you know, asked it from the company's IT security. So if if the rumors are true, if the rumors are true, you know, job well done. Most likely all that compromising data also was in just in one chip file with a giant gigantic button like button next to it. Do you want to download all the patient files? Click yes. My my God. This is the reason, people, why you have to encrypt your goddamn data for the hundredth time. This is the reason why you don't use Facebook. You go and use Signal app for your private conversation. Says, says the podcast that has a Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> but operated from, from an account that is empty. <laughs> okay. So, what's your history with this film, Henrik? I've never actually seen this one before. You ro- raised up the name when you suggested that we would look into this one. And I imidi- immediately was thinking another movie. A Spanish death cult horror film. I was like, oh yeah, 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 I'm, I'm all in. We can, we can watch Spanish death cult horror film. And then I finally pieced two and two together and found the actual movie that we were supposed to watch. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is nothing like a Spanish death cult horror film. This is, weirdly enough, yet another Colombian gangland depiction. Yeah. Are you getting yellow-bellied, Henrik? Don't you want to look at something else than horror for a change? Well, yes. And then I saw this one and I was like, well... That's not, this is not that different. The the major realization that I had, now that I have finally seen Sinombre, the, the, like the actual film that we, Sinombre, that we were supposed to watch, I, I, I had this weird feeling through and throughout the film that, wait a minute, why, why do I feel like I have seen this one before? And hence a bad film, is that it? <laughs> yeah. Well, not exactly. We, we can still linger on the question, is it a good film? But it, it's it's not necessary because I've seen it. I, even though I most definitely have seen it. Interesting. Have seen it, but have not seen it. Yeah. And, and something that that was also quite interesting. I mean, obviously, I I have seen seen this one because this is not the first Mexican. You know, th- this is how America sees Mexico film. This is not the first. We we have this gang problem in Mexico film I've seen, but also because I really have seen this film before. That the first time I, that I saw this one, it was in Technicolor. It was John Wayne in it, and it was Rio Bravo or something like that by its name. Because looking at the film, something that came extremely clear to me was that in its in its kind of a core, in its build, this is a western. These are all goddamn westerns. These are neo westerns. Every single time that you have an American filmmaker that decides to do a film that takes place in Mexico, or you have an American production house that decides that we are going to do a film in Mexico, or film film that covers the topic of Mexico, every single goddamn time, it's it's some sort of a neo-Western. Sometimes, sometimes you have the, the Rocket Rancher, and that's your no country for old men. Sometimes the new sheriff rides to town and he's real tough and he's been active he's been played by Benicio del Toro in Sicario. Or then then you have the Mexico equals drug drugs and rampant violence depictions, which is sin nombre. And i I'm really I became really curious that why is it? Like what is it with Mexico that every single time that you let Americans have a go with Mexico. It's it's always some kind of a Mexico as a hellhole, neo-Western type of deal. Like, God damn it, does nobody ever forget the goddamn Alamo? Well, and... <clears throat> we, if we are talking about uh, themes here, this is hardly even 
the only film that or let's say that also the Mexicans have made films about Mexican drug cartels. The point is that the subject is really interesting and topical and original, just like Polish people can't just help themselves not to make films about the Second World War because like uh, from what I've seen it seems it's almost starting to look like 95% of their films are only about Captain World War II and even the public dialogue for God's sakes. But um, yeah, I think it's an interesting uh, story that still is getting asses into seats whenever there's no COVID-19. I don't know if it's so much the interesting story because like I mentioned the story has been told countless of times. Actually, Sin Nombre's story has been told so many times that halfway through the point of the film, I kind of already was just listing off the tropes that will go off in these type of, type of films almost all at a time, every time. Looking forward to it. But Eric, let's yeah, get well. the film overview. Two intersecting storylines here which meet and one of a Honduran girl who wants to immigrate to the US and one of a gang member caught up in circles of violence in case you haven't watched this film yet. And Fukusan, as I like to call him, as a Shenmue fan of course, uh, Fukusan said that there's no moral message in the film per se, but he hopes people who see it will make an emotional connection and feel empathy and that then the film in his world has been successful in its mission as per Fukunaga. Yeah, not necessarily moral message. I would say political message most definitely. Interesting. Uh, he wanted especially to keep the politics out of it as best as possible. And just concentrate on well, the character arcs, the, the story of these characters, their survival story. Yeah, that's not actually something that I got from the film. The, what um, I felt Fukunaga was more interested in was actually, once again, depicting the frontier or the West, air quotation marks, like not, not the West, not the frontier as, an, as a physical place, but more as a state of mind or more as an elusive, Ill, immaterial plane, an idea, which is something that has been, which is something that is being carried over from the John Wayne era westerns and the American notion of of frontier and frontier life and what frontier is supposed to pre uh, present to what I take is is the American experience. Yeah, this uh, depiction of a uh, well, it's not outright stated here, but you get this vibe that the characters are being told that. That honey, there's nothing here for you. You just have to pack your shit and get to the train, and then you get to this dreamland, this paradise. And at the end of the film, it's not exactly that. Yeah, which is kind of the go-to lesson of whenever American decides to do a film about Mexico. But <laughs> that—that's one of the tropes. One of the tropes that I—I yeah. I picked up immediately. Like, please don't Mexico come here. Mexico is a miserable hellhole where everybody is poor. And everything is ruled by gangs, and you are either in a gang or then you are dog meat. And everybody wants to immigrate to America because you know American dream and the land of the free. Everything is so much better in there. Uh, yeah, and the gallantly streaming River Henrik. But talking about Gary Joji Fukunaga, American director born in California, seventy-seven. His father was a third-generation Japanese American and his mother a Swedish-American. Uh, Fukunaga had other aspirations, wanted to be a pro snowboarder, but decided to go with filmmaking instead. Started as a cameraman, intern, and later applied to film school. And has a Bachelor of Arts in History. And this is Gary Fukunaga's debut film, so... And like many of his films, he has also written it. Kind of a talented, uh, multi-talented guy. Because he also made, fuck, uh, this is the Sons of Sins of No Nation. What is the name, Henrik? Uh, Beast of No Nation. Beasts of No Nation. That is available on Netflix right now for your listening and watching pleasure. He, re he had written it, directed it, and produced it. And uh, Most likely also acted in 
and uh, also filmed it. And he did the soundtrack and and all, all, all the lighting effects and this is this, this start to starts to sound once again one of the, these type of projects. Uh, yeah, yeah. He also used deep fake, so he was able to act all the characters and uh, no, but. Uh, uh, regarding Zinombra, he spent two to three years, depending on which interview of this guy you're looking at, researching the film, and spent time with people on the trains with about 45 gangsters, uh, some in prison, some outside of prison, some active, some not, acti not active in Central America. And somehow he was able to get uh, two gang members to improve the dialogue of the gang members to make the slang more realistic. He has had a lot of exposure in general to different cultures. He lived in France, Japan, London, Mexico City, currently resides in NYC, and speaks fluent French and Spanish. Talented bastard, as I said. What kind of movies has he pushed out, Henrik? There is this uh, Chinatown film project from 2009. It was some kind of a omnibus film in which he directed a segment. And then came the Sin Nombre, his first actual film in the same year. Then there was Jane Eyre, a romantic drama film with a lot of uh, big name cast, Michael Fassbender and Jamie Bell, Judy Dench, Mia Vasikovska. Then there was Beasts of No Nation, his most well-known work, one could argue, so far, because Bond is not out yet. Uh, war drama, it's based on the novel by Uzodina Iveala and Idris Elba starring. Fukunaga also wrote It with Chase Palmer and Gary Doberman. And he was sl slated to direct it actually, but he left the project three weeks before the production was about to begin for some reason. And he was the executive producer for On the Ice, uh, directed by Andrew Ogpiaha McLean. And it's about this Inuit hunter on the frozen Arctic Ocean, which won tons of awards to film. And He's also known for directing all the first eight episodes of the True Detective series and all ten episodes of Netflix's dark comedy series Maniac, so maybe check those out. He's, as I was mentioning, also the director of the hopefully upcoming Tampax Tampon, the movie. I mean the Bond film, No Time to Die. <laughs> and he was announced as the director of this film in September 2018, after Danny Boyle left the project. So Fukunaga will be effectively the first American director to do a Bond film, believe it or not. Personality-wise, I like the guy, seems to have a great sense of, sense of humor, he's very straight, very honest. Pleasure to listen to the interviews that he's been doing. Regarding Zinombra, he said to the interviewer when asked, why did you choose this topic? He said, it may sound cliche, but sometimes the topics choose you. So it was kind of a small accidental steps that led him to the story. He was in a film school and uh, wanted to make a film about the subject that was important. And he made this uh, short film called Victoria Paracino in 2004, where there are these uh, Mexicans who are trapped into a truck which crosses the border and, uh, and the immigrants actually uh, die inside the truck because of heat. And this was based on an actual accident that happened. He had no plan to make a feature film out of the idea, but he was asked to do a script for one, and it made sense for Mr. Fukunaga. And maybe the best kind of a review that he could get for this film is that uh, when he was discussing the film with some real gang members, they said that the film is a, quote, fair portrayal of gangs. Yeah, maybe gangs, I don't know about the rest of it. Okay. Like, the, the, the first notion that I... I, I have, we, well, basically the whole Sinombre is that, as you mentioned, uh, Fukunaka himself is not Mexican. He is only real, but kind of a personal ties to Mexico outside of, you know, living in Mexico City for X number amount of time, which I was never able to find how long that stay lasted. Well, is that, well, his parents remarried. So, whoop do it there. Uh, so essentially, even though the film itself takes place in Mexico, was largely, largely shot in Mexico, has 
Mexican cast, and even though the Mexican gang members, gang members did take some part in fixing the dialogue or sharpening it to sound more realistic gang language, the direction and the story itself, they still come from American perspective. And because of that, the movie itself is a depiction of American perspective. It's how American sees Mexico. And <laughs> well, are, are you saying to... that if you're an American, you are not allowed to make a Mexican drug cartel or gang movie? Of course not. That that would would be completely, you know, ludicrous to make that kind of a statement. Naturally, so... I mean, God damn it! Hey, I I love Martin Scorsese films, who very mu often does a violent depiction of mafia and gangster life. And I'm fine with that too, even though, to my understanding, Scorsese himself has never really done or lived a gangster life. Of course, you have an artistic freedom in the topics you decide to, you know, depict. Okay, I, I, I really want to get into this in like a honest uh, conversation. Like, uh, what is there something fraudulent or something that you find that is not authentic enough? As we see, there's has there has been a lot of care has been taken to make it as accurate as possible, and it has been given this fair comment from the gang members themselves. And also, there are actors or extras who have been immigrants or are immigrants themselves. There's also the uh, lead star, the lady playing Saria or Saira. She her family has been gone through similar experiences, so she really wanted to play this character yeah 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 uh nothing of that says that fukunaga is is a bad director bad guy or the nombre is a bad film or the film shouldn't exist i i'm not holding any of that as a thought against fukunaga or the or the nombre itself but but none of those points really actually in my opinion they don't really that much mean anything the, the gang, gang members, yeah, they, they made a comment that it's a fair depiction. But that was in relation to the gang life. And mm -hmm. you kind of have to pay close attention to that. It's They, they didn't state that it, it's a fair depiction of, of Mexico, Mexicans, any of that. It's fair depiction of gang life. It's very secular thing with, with they felt, which they felt that the film is being fair. Uh, also, using real immigrants as extras or having lead actress who has gone through a situation similar to the situation that you depict in your film, it still doesn't mean that you actually are quote unquote documenting real life or that you even so. have an understanding of what that life is. You may do research, yeah. I, I believe that Fukunaga has interviewed people. I believe that Fukunaga has read a lot of books and reports. But that none of that automatically translates into you being an expert. I don't think he's making even that point. But he did the best possible film that he could muster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and kudos to Fukunaga there. Like, I'm not trying to burn Fukunaga himself on, on a stake here. What I'm more aiming at is that I'm really surprised to finally notice that this actually, at least to me, when it comes to, you know, like said, American films depicting Mexico, I'm actually seeing a recurring trend here. And I'm quite curious on why do I see this trend? Why, no. why do I feel that I'm actually noticing repeatedly resurfacing tropes? actual goddamn tropes why that is why is it that you have an american filmmaker who makes a film about mexico and it always seems to boil down into the same exact notions mexico is a shithole mexicans all are gangsters every mexican wants to leave mexico if you are a woman in mexico you are a an what? old hack or an ugly woman or then you are oh. a walking rape victim why is this kind of a like no, no. Well, of course, where, this is... where does where does the kind of a? Well, I mean, of course, this is coming from a certain truncated truncated reference. We have to look at the main characters of the film, and we have to go in that kind of train of thought. No pun intended. And we can't, you know, 
I think we see a lot of real characters here. And uh, I, I don't think the film is in itself saying that this place is a complete shithole, but the characters have to have, you know, the the motivation, the initiation for them to leave for their journey. So I don't really see the problem that you're describing. The the problem, air quotation marks, because once again, I'm not hanging the film on Fukunaga here, but like you mentioned, the characters have, or the characters are leaving. They are going. That That's what they always do. Or then they are crooked persons or they are someone who can't leave. Like, I... I don't remember American film depicting mix Mexico where Mexicans would have actually been happy to live in Mexico. That's kind of my point. But all is forgiven, Henrik, because there is no more piss filter as usually when Mexico is depicted in US films. I mean, <clears throat> I don't know what the hell once again Spectre was doing, but it had this uh, <laughs> it it got stuck with this Mexican filter for the rest of the film. So, uh, uh, at least there is no yeah, yeah, big yeah, problem. Yeah, 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 you mean, you mean color scheme. Yeah, I do, I, I do. Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, yeah, that I must admit, that is absent. The film uses very much uh, quite realistic uh, coloring throughout the movie, and it's not through any, any kind of orange-tinted filter. Although it would have been kind of nice to see that once they're crossing the Rio Grande or the river, that now suddenly the, the filter changes color completely as we have arrived to the US. Everything's back to normal. But do we want to talk about illegal immigration from Mexico to the US? Because we are the best experts of this subject. Well, you know, sure, why not? Fukunaga made a film about it. Yeah, <laughs> I was uh, dabbling in the Pew Research website, which is this website for for respected data when it comes to different kinds of uh, societal issues. Immigration in general, 11.6 million Mexican immigrants lived in the US in 2017 when this study was of which data this study was made of. About 43 of them illegally entered and out of all illegal immigrants, 47% were Mexicans. 25% of all immigrants in the U.S. are Mexicans, and Mexicans were deported uh, 920,334 times in fiscal 2017. Mexican unauthorized immigration is going down ever since the peak around 2007, and immigration from other countries is now higher. Actually, 10.5 million unauthorized immigrants live in the U.S., which represents 3.2% of the total U.S. population, which is down by 1.7 mil since 2007. And six states account for 57% of unauthorized immigrants. These are Texas, California, New Jersey, Florida, New York, and Illinois. 66% and rising of these unauthorized immigrants have been in the U.S. for over a decade. And this whole immigration crisis is a problem that can be described as a so-called wicked problem. A wicked problem is a problem to which you don't have clear answers how to solve it. And there's a lot of moving parts. Situations change all the time, different political environments. And, you know, the approach that you have to have, have to, has to kind of evolve when the situation changes. And of course, there is the DACA and DREAM Act. Uh, DACA is uh, the U.S.'s Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. 79.4% uh, of DACA immigrants are Mexicans. An average age of these is 24. Uh, so DACA is the, what I would call the watered-down version of the, of the uh, DREAM Act, which would eventually provide citizenship for people who were brought to America under the age of 16 as illegal immigrants, if certain conditions apply. And DACA will not allow event eventual citizenship, but it will provide for a uh, renewable and temporary two-year work permit. And uh, it will postpone a possible future deportation, hence deferred action. How beautiful. And this is the best that Barack Obama could do back in 2012. 
So that's my little overview of the immigration law and immigration. Yeah, of course, when it comes to the statistics, you do well to remember that the statistics are ext- extremely hard to keep 100% precise. Mm-hmm. So, especially when it comes to the exact number of how many immigrants come from Mexico and what the actual per- percentage is, that's that's something that per- perhaps you never actually get the one ha- the, the completely correct figure because the the whole but basically the whole Mexican immigration experience it's something that where many factors exist the, the first one is that if you are an immigrant immigrant that have started his journey somewhere else North America than Mexico and you get caught on the on the border on the and you you get deported back the deporting officers of course immediately ask where are you from where you are going to be deported back into and in that case you know if you if you are further down some other place than mexico it of course makes a lot of sense to just make a claim i'm a mexican in that case they you know they just deport you back to Mexico and it's much easier to retry crossing the border wall which is something which can easily start to fix the numbers upwards like you you get a much higher number of air quotes amongst Mexican immigrants or Mexican attempt immigration attempts or illegal crossings of the border wall than what you really have because they are all the other people are also lumped into the Mexican percentage. The another thing that easily abides into these type of statistics is the, also the fact that there are a hell of a lot of people who have to try to illegally cross the border a repeated repeated amount of times. Like back in back in the eighties, the situation was so bad that one person could make like 10 repeated attempts of illegal crossing. Every single time that you would capture that one person, he would just give you another name. I'm Juan, I'm Hector, I'm San Jose. And every single one of those, because they the officers couldn't really check it out, the, all, all of those attempts, those aliases would be recorded as individual persons. So one pa- person can become two persons simply by taking giving a different alias. Uh, some help into this eventually was applied when fingerprinting and fingerprint AD it is became into the picture. But at this point, also of course, the illegal crossers started to use things like cutting, sandpapering different types of types of acids and because of because of all these these moving factors in the immigration and illegal crossing it's hard to say like like pin, with, with, with a pinpoint accuracy that this mm-hmm. is the per- percentage and this is the real amount of people the most likely is is can't can't say how much but i would be willing to believe that notable amount of air in those numbers yeah, definitely. I was thinking about the same thing when reading it. Do we have anything on Mara Salvatrucha or MS-13 that you want to discuss about? Uh, not on my end. Yeah, this is uh, the... Uh, I, I don't know what you have. Oh, well, nothing special really. It's just it, it's the international criminal gang, rather ubiquitous nowadays, because it started in Los Angeles, California in the 70s and 80s. And has now spread all over into Latin America, Mexico, and uh, several parts of the U.S. Yeah, in, in here I I have to confess that I became somewhat imita- uh, intimidated by the whole idea of trying to do some kind of a deep research in the. Yeah, no kidding. <clears throat> yeah. So you you mostly because the situation between the gangs, who is the ro- ruling gang, who controls what area, it shifts like constantly, like goddamn crazy. And because of that, it's it's kind of a nightmare. Try to 
actually really, really find solid information. What is the gang situation? Which gang is in ruling position? And with, with how large of a margin? Yeah, there was a very, very interesting sounding book that I would have loved to read before doing this episode related to uh, Mexican gang related violence. But of course, we are a fucking weekly podcast, so scratch that. Yeah, you can kind of max, you can sneak in only one book into, into an episode. Well, <laughs> hardly even that. In the trailer, it's uh, screaming that this film is about redemption and faith. Yeah, well, obviously the redemption part didn't fully work for our lead character. But uh, yeah, I guess there's redemption and faith. There is a, a certain the, the type of redemption. Like our our main character, the yeah, like our lead gang member character, Casper slash Willy. Slash Willy. Um, he kind of sort of manages to maybe redeem himself. He becomes less less self absorbed absorbed and he does cut his ties to the gang and he does try to help another person so in in on that regard there, there is a certain type of redemption that can be found in in casper's story arc is, yeah. is it is it really a big redemption not necessarily does casper really do all that you know to redeem himself to redeem his past actions unknown to be honest e even the amount of regret that casper really has towards his past doing is kind of a let left ambiguous you don't you don't really know. you you notice that there's it, it becomes clear that there is some regret behind casper but what is he actually regretting yeah because the way how the film lays it out, it more appears to be the situation that Casper is just regretting the fact that he was unable to protect his girlfriend. Not so much all the, all, all the you know, beatings, killings, and drug hustling that he has done. Yeah, when it comes to the international trailer for the film, or the US trailer, I guess I'm happy that the trailer voice has kind of subsided from trailers nowadays. Because, you know, there's this, this rather silly parts, like, are, aren't them in the trailers every time, but, like, She was taking a chance to get a better life. He was caught up in a world of brutality. But when he tried to leave his violent past behind, his own gang put a price on his head. Then he met the one person who would change his life forever. Yeah, as long as he lived anyway, which wasn't for long, so so much for forever. Mm -hmm. And that that's basically it. <laughs> like, it's full of this kind of a silly hyperboles and uh, does kind of disservice for the feel of the film. But it's, it's not even that bad. But that kind of is the, the film itself also. Because the story of Sin Nombre, it is extremely linear and there really is not that many plot threads to follow. Train shoot was one of the more interesting aspects perhaps of this film. I mean, the budget wasn't sky high. Was it 7 million? And they had only five days to shoot on top of the trains. Fukunaga described it as expensive and dangerous, which is kind of easy to see because, you know, you had 150 crew on real moving train extremely dangerous and then there is the uh, fake like top of a train that was also manufactured which was built uh, on top of a trailers so which was driven around in the country roads simulating being on top of a train and a lot of the action scenes where something bad happens on the trailer uh, at least or perhaps some certain close-ups those are not on the real train and perhaps you can see it on the movement when you kind of know this fact and Look at how it's moving, but yeah. Uh, when it comes to the other location shoots, there is the destroyer house, the house of the gang members of this uh, confetti neighborhood. And this is part real and part built set. They have found a parking lot and a building next to the airport where they were and they uh, found it. But uh, they found it also, also that it was kind of a mistake. 
and due to the noise levels, which is a nightmare for for the audio guys. But uh, they shot for a total of six weeks this film. Rather remarkable, I would say. And four weeks of this was in Mexico City, where Mexico doubled for Honduras and was it a Chiapas or what is the one city and Texas. Oh, and this was um, also shot in, uh, yeah, also shot in Torreon. So yeah, a year was uh, spent casting the film. We have uh, Willie or the El Casper played by Edgar Flores. First, this character was meant to be a Mexican character, but this character was changed into a Honduran because the actor is from Honduras. And uh, Fuku did four to five trips to Honduras, and on these trips he found the actor Edgar Flores. Then we have Smiley, played by Christian Ferrer. Mexican actor, active since 2001, born in 95, had lead roles in films such as uh, Guten Tag Ramon, 2013 Mexican drama film, and 600 Miles from 2015, also a Mexican drama of sorts. And for both, he got nominated for Ariel Award for the Best Actor. And then we have Syra, played by Paulina Gaitan. Mexican TV movie actress, and maybe most famously played uh, the young wife of drug lord Pablo Escobar in Netflix's Narcos. Then we have Martha Marlene, played by Diana Garcia. Willie's romantic interest before she gets killed. Nothing really about that. Then we have Lil Mago, which translates into Magician. Played by Tenoch Huerta, or Huerta. Mexican actor, born 81. And then we have the real migrant extras here and there. And since we are not a Mexican podcast, we are going to probably leave it at that. Yeah, I, I guess so. Because I was actually expecting you to be much more into Teno Huerta, See, seeing how the actor actor has also appeared in in the James Bond Spectre film. What? Yeah. Yeah. He he was he was some kind of a dude in the background in in, in an elevator scene. What? <laughs> I have to check this. Mexican man in lift. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So in, in the end, it all once again com, comes back down to double O zero. God damn it. Yeah, nice catch. Maybe that's the reason, real reason why Fukunaga got the directing job on No Time to Die. <laughs> because he, he had pre- previously worked with Huerta, who had been in the franchise. So there was a connection to producers. Went like, hey, I, I guess that dude... That Fukunaga guy can come along with our, you know, the rest of the coming Bond film cast since he has already worked with this one person. Yeah, it was like Barbara Broccoli was sipping on her umpteenth pumpkin spice latte and went like, oh, let's see what we have on IMDb on the profiles of my favorite movie, Spectre. Oh, okay, this guy (laughs) has a connection to Fukunaga. Hired. Yeah, there's a real, pretty funny Twitter profile going by the name Eon Employee, who is not an actual Eon Employee, but makes fun of Barbara Broccoli all the time there. So a little bit of useless tidbit for you. Okay, carrying on. Cinematography by Adrienne Goldman. Anything about him? Mm, unfortunately, not on my end. Yeah, Brazilian TV and uh, cinema, uh, Brazilian TV and movie cinematographer born in Sao Paulo. He got the nomination uh, in category of Outstanding Cinematography for a single camera series in the length of one hour for his work on Netflix's series called The Crown. But anyway, uh, when they were putting this film together, Sin Nombre, Fukunaga gave us at least one piece of information regarding how they approached the cinematography of the film, which was that they tried to make each shot and compose to tell a scene. So there is supposed to be a lot of 
power within one shot to know what is happening. I, I don't know. Isn't that kind of the go-to response <laughs> of every single director on the face of the earth? Like every frame I take is a masterpiece. Yeah, or I think this is just how you approach cinematography altogether. Mm, have you heard about anything about this this way to harden up the gang members by kicking them for un, until the count of 13 is done? No, I personally haven't. But then again, there are these rituals of, of criminal gangs, they are so varied and oftentimes so goddamn ludicrous that it's impossible to keep track on all of them. That it is. I found this little uh, moment funny that the uh, lady that Willie is in love with, this first one at least, has a sticker, say no to drugs on her door. <laughs> Smile is there looking at having them having sex. And, um, huh. well, first of all, we have this lady who is angry about something, and then she is uh, apparently easily pleased by this little flower that was bought from this transvestite or whatever was this character supposed to be. And, yeah, they have sex after that, because that's the power of of flowers. And uh, I guess Smiley is there only to find out what the hell the uh, gang member Willie is doing. And he finds out that, uh, well, it's just for honorable deeds of having sex and uh, nothing more to it. But tells him to not tell anybody else, of course, that that uh, he has this love interest because then uh, she might be risked into the path of violence. And that happens quite quickly, how to say. Yep. Because if, if, if nothing else, every woman is a rape victim. Yeah, and... Uh, of course, when Smiley kills the rival ex-gang member, apparently they feed him, as promised, immediately to the perros. Which is probably a bad idea, as, you know, the saying goes. Something like, once a dog gets conditioned into the taste of human flesh, might as well get rid of that dog. Yup. Then again, you know, a damn gangs, once again. Yeah, it's probably hardening them when, when they when they all get infected from dog bites. Also something that I didn't quite get is the Guatemala-Mexico border crossing because this uh, family of Zaira gets uh, thoroughly inspected. There's this officer who gets them all together and then says that, strip, but then somehow they are not caught. They just continue. Yeah, to my understanding, there is a noticeable difference in between the different parts and how the Power Patrol reacts. The people who they know most certainly, once again, are, are illegal immigrants or are attempting to become illegal immigrants. And God. Like they're, they're, once again, this is me going off with a limited amount of background research into the whole subject matter. So I may have gotten things wrong or read, read wrong sources. But to my understanding, there are situations where they, if the, the border patrol people, they actually just let, let these people walk past uh, to the next, next country or next city just so that the trouble or the inconvenience would be out of their hands and it would be the next lot's problem. Much in the same way how the film also depicts how, well, basically, the people living in these these cities and countries, how they react differently to the mass of, of immigrants that pass their country by. The first scene that you get of, of, of this immigrant citizen relationship is actually a pretty positive one. The, the citizens are running alongside the train, throwing apples and other fruit to the immigrants who most likely are, who most definitely are already starving. And the next scene that, that follows later on, that depicts you with school, uh, school children throwing rocks at the immigrants. So there is that, that change of attitudes that breaks once the once the train leaves 
one area and enters the next one. Yeah, there is. I paid attention to that as well. Also, something that I paid attention attention to is that the older brother says that this might be even a two to three week journey that is about to commence. Like, oh my God, how how slow are these trains actually? Or have they prepared to hop off the train every now and then and get a new train? I don't know, but sounds like so hopeless. And add to that, uh, there is always this nascent fear of the police that might be coming around any corner during the, during the story. You can't really predict how long it's going to take. And, and honestly, I'm perplexed why they, they are allowed to be on the roof of the train for such a long time. I mean, anybody could report them right away. You'd think that they would be reported pretty fast because they're all visibly plainly naked to the eye. And the train crew doesn't apparently care. The police is not really quite interested, nor is the public. Yeah, and once again, just sticking to my limited understanding of of Mexican American immigration, that actually is something that happens. Mm. Like there, there really is is that train line. It exists. It operates semi regularly, and it is actually being quite heavily favored by those who try to do this kind of a long, long way immigration. They could they take the long route to reach America, because you kind of you you have two choices. Either either you take the train, or then you try to walk all the way to America. And depending on what 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 is your original point of origin, that trip can actually get really fucking long. Like you can be, if you walk it, you may have to spend like months on the road trying to walk your way to America. So many prefer the train. And when it comes to kind of supervising the train, keeping it clear of immigrants, when it comes to, once again, the how police or the officials react to the situation it kind of it, it varies it it varies between authorities it varies between countries it varies between cities that's actually that's one of the main reasons why those long way immigrants why they they so easily actually when when they get caught on the mexico us border what and when they are being in, interrogated about their country of origin, their place of origin, why they so easily, you know, just answer Mexico, because that's a hell of a lot easier way to, you know, start your next attempt than to be de deported all the way back to the begin beginning of your journey. Attempted ra rape, as we discussed earlier, is right here, and uh, it seems to kind of come out of nowhere, because you weren't telling me about your whereabouts for a couple of days. Therefore, I'm going to rape your lady friend because reasons. And there is this uh, quote. What are the most important things of friendship? He says, this gang leader to the lady. Honesty, respect and generosity. I would say that he certainly breaks one of those rules right there. The respect part by trying to rape the lady. Yeah, but he doubles it down, or, or he doubles it in generosity that he's supposed to receive in this situation. Oh yeah. Yep. Like I can, I can very easily see that Lil Ma goes that the whole go, the process going through his he head is that yeah, yeah, he has actually right to touch a lady against her wishes because you know why shouldn't El Casper then be generous? And share share his girlfriend. Yeah, but that's kind of the the, the running theme with when it comes to the gang men. And now I'm not counting in El Casper because El Casper precisely breaks away from the gang. But those who stay, stick with the gang, um, the film itself it, it has two rape scenes uh, <clears throat> or attempted rapes. Yeah, the, the first one. Yeah, the, the first one is is the Martha Marlene attempt. Which is kind of the inciting incident for for Casper, who now is heartbroken by the loss of loss of his girlfriend, girlfriend, and decides to break away from the gang. 
And the second one is the attempt on Saira at the top of the train. And in both of these cases, the way how Il Lil Mago seems to approach the situation is that since he is a man in a, in a position of power, he has a right to command ownership to a woman immediately whenever he lays his eyes upon her. Which to me is kind of, kind of the main dynamic that plays out in, in these attempts. And why the attempts come so easily for Lil Mago. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, the, the gang depicted in Sin, Sin no, no Prey, it, it looks very much like it, it is a certain type of death trap to basically to any woman who comes in contact with the gang. Unless you go and once again, trope of these type of types of films, you are either an old person or quote unquote ugly woman when no we in which cases absolutely fucking no one wants to touch you, hence you are actually safe from the gangs. Yeah, one key moment is indeed this uh second attempted rape. The trip to Tonala to rob the train. There was one interviewer of Fukunaga who pointed out Rightly so, that it's kind of interesting to see that uh, throughout the film the gang is somehow able to catch up to the train when they're doing the robbing and then next time when Smiley is sent on his kill or be killed mission. And um, you know, Fukunaga had basically nothing to say about that, he kind of skipped that. But I find it quite, quite, quite interesting still. I mean Smiley is walking all the way back to the base. If uh, that we are that we are at least uh, suggested from the cinematography, so yeah. Yeah, and and to listeners who haven't checked out the film, also a key thing to remember here is that Smiley is the child recruit of the gang. Yeah. So he's not a grown man, which you know I don't I'm not an expert here, but might somehow effect on exactly how fast Smiley can walk. Mm -hmm. So they're doing something quite inhumane here, robbing already desperate and poor people of their kind as well. And it's something that the gang does here in many moments, or there are situations where Willie sees that uh, what the gang is doing is not exactly to his liking. He disapproves what uh, how Lil Mago is running the show. For example, when Smiley is being kicked on the ground for the first time to tough him, him up to join the ranks. Yeah, but then again, that's also some a type of a trope. I I would say um, hollow regret mm -hmm. or hollow displeasure on. Towards how the gang operates. Yeah, gotta wonder. Because even even though even though Casper seems to be troubled when the gang is is group kicking Smiley, it still doesn't limit Casper from bringing Smiley into the gang. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't stop Casper from recruiting Smiley. Yeah, it's uh, hard to see even how how Willie joined this gang after all if he is so weak in these situations where he should be at his toughest to be able to function in some level in the group. But this kind of a gang behavior, trying to rob the already poor people on top of the train, for example, it really starts to spark your anger as, as a viewer and makes you wish you could be like some kind of a godlike figure who could just lock up these kind of people. And that kind of leads you to think that that uh, the lack of fear towards, well, God in these people most likely has corrupted people of nowadays. I mean, like you said, we are not dealing with some, well, very elegant people that you see in the Westerns where they are uh, trying to shoot each other uh, uh, next to the saloon. We don't get any of that. That's That's kind of the the stylish way to kill somebody, but these are just thugs in the worst way. <laughs> these are essentially the counterpart for the Native Americans of John Wayne films. 
that a bunch of bloodthirsty savages who just want to kill white people and rape all the women. In in here, the native, natives have been, you know, switched to gang members. Killing white people has been switched to selling drugs. And raping all the women is, well, well that's still raping all the women. Yeah, I, I think you're... I think you are drawing a lot of simplifications in the characterization of this film. I don't find all all this so simplified as you seem to find it. And I don't know, let's see how much crap you're willing to give to this film when we get to the would you recommend this film section, but kind of interested about that. But I, I don't know. I. Uh... In in what level now? Not in counting the two main gang me members that you have, Smiley and El Ca and Casper. How much real character you see? Because to me, the gang once again reads very much like a collection of tropes. Well, there, there was the loyalty. We are family. We stick together. We we have the funky funky signs. We make devil horns at funerals. The type of crap which, in the end, doesn't really mean anything to gang members, as we see how, well, how Il Lil Mago operates throughout the film. Where, ob obviously, you know, respect and loyalty doesn't mean anything if, if someone would make the argument that respect and loyalty would require you not to rape a fellow gang member's girlfriend. Well, how do you think these characters should be, then, depicted? Like, are you seeing something that is not really accurate uh, in the real world, or would not be accurate in your view? Because I'm no, no, definitely, I, I can, I, because I'm definitely I, I defi getting the vibe that uh, that this is the kind of way that the gang life could be. There's one dumbass on the lead, and then just uh, uh, doing what he wants and playing this kind of a god figure who wants to rape so rape all the kids. Uh, well, two notions with that. Uh, first of all. Yeah, I can. I can actually. What is my once again limited understanding of of gang life, Mexican gang life, etc. That uh, this actually does fit the bill because gangs are brutal and most definitely kind of in hospital groups towards women. But the another no, another notion, like since you asked what I would have wanted to. I don't know, maybe a film that would have taken a deeper look into the gang, how the gang di dynamics work, mm -hmm. and what is the inner thought process of a gang member. What does Casper and Smiley, and especially Lil Mago, go through in their head heads? Obviously, obviously, this is not that type of film. Mm -hmm. uh, this is more of an action, adventure, crime. We have to immigrate to the U.S., storyline and the main focus is on that immigrant journey i get that but mm -hmm. at the same time you know simply because that's logical for this film that you don't get into the you know the inner headspace of gang members that strongly even though that is understandable and agreeable on sin nombre i fail to see how that translates into the gang members being multifaceted and complex characters and me simp simply simplifying these complex characters. And to heard... me, they still read as si uh, pretty one-note characters. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of right about that, because the, yeah, there is nothing really built in the beginning of the film regarding these characters of Willy or Smiley. They just uh, appear in the scene and they seem to be already conditioned in the way that they want to be either a part of the gang or seem to be in some way inside the gang but there is no backstory why they are and what are their motivations there but they certainly have a motivation to get out of there but yeah it would have been nicer to get some backstory yeah and once again i'm I'm not like demanding more backstory and deeper look in the gang life in case of sin nombre mm -hmm. but since since they are one note I actually do see the parallel the way how well old Western films depicted the Native Americans, where they also serve the exact same function as the gang does serves here. They are some kind of a hostile, violent outer force that the main characters have to have to compete and evade in some shape or form. Mm, well, I wouldn't say that they are really one dimensional either. 
for example, Smiley goes through a bunch of emotions and also he can be seen clearly questioning of what he has been doing. And But uh, once again, yeah, the motivation, why am I doing this? Why do I want to even join this to begin with is uh, a question that I would have wanted to be answered. Yeah, and I, I would still re reiterate my, my argument that I actually do feel that they are extremely one-dimensional outside of Casper and Smiley. Okay, well... And once again, once again, to be perfectly clear, I'm not faulting Sinombre for this. I, I'm not saying Sinombre is a bad film or Fukunaga is a bad filmmaker or anything of that sort. I'm merely curious about the trend that I finally actually feel, uh, that I feel I am noticing in repeatedly, I, I would say, about all the goddamn time when Americans start to do a film about Mexico. And I am curious why that is, why this is so persisting trend. And once again, the go-to, uh, pretty much the only answer that I have been able to find up until this point, you know, our, our tonight, uh, to, to, tonight's recording session, is that it has to do with the American notion of the West and the frontier, air quotation marks, and the way how, even though Americans have moved past Westerns as a, as a genre, you don't get your John Wayne movies anymore. If you get, you get them as indie features, like with something like Matt Mikkelsen lead, playing the lead role. Or the League of Extraordinary but, Gentlemen. <laughs> but, but I'm not touching that obvious bait of yours, but <laughs> what Americans haven't been able to do is really shed their skin of Westerns as a, as a, as a kind of an idea, or they, they have quit doing Westerns, the, the genre, the movies, but they are still doing neo-Westerns. They are still taking the, the notion that, the, that your John Wayne films carried with them, and they are simply rebranding it, and the, the rebranding seems to constantly be that of Mexicans. Mm. These are essentially a skin job. And I'm kind of like, for, for this past week, when I have been preparing for our today's session, my main question has that I have repeatedly found myself asking is, why? Why is the frontier, air quotation marks, so extremely important to the Americans that they just can't let it go? The best, you know, kind of answer that I have managed to do, like I, I've done, read like a group of essays that have tried to explain that the, the frontier and frontiers meaning and importance to, to how America was shaped up. Is that the frontier as an idea is kind of an integral to America itself and how America and Americans see themselves. Mm -hmm. Like Frederick Jackson Turner made the notion that, that the frontier was not so much, like its, its importance wasn't so much that it, it was a place where the settlers could set up. It, they, more its importance was more that it was a meeting point between savagery and civilization Be between the you know the bloodthirsty savages and a man of civilized christian upbringing and because of that the frontier would have been kind of the 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 best example the the, the line of most rapid and effective americanization it's I, I kind of find I just fascinating this notion that the American experience and the kind of the need to find and refine frontier would be so e essential to Americans. Well, I think what was essential for Fukunaga when making this film was just simply to raise the subject matter once again and uh, just try to improve the situation legally wise in the US for these people. And I'm not entirely certain of that. Like that's that's where I actually do have my hard time to actually agree 
with Fukunaga. That's that's something that Fukunaga has implied in his interviews. That that is mm-hmm. correct. Like you mentioned the whole statement how how the topic chooses you. But e- even even with that statement, it kind of a, to me it came with with a grain of salt because as as, as you laid it out, Sinombre uh, is the whole main idea the script of Sinombre it, it lays heavily on on the short film Victoria Paracino and that that got Fukunaga into Sundance but Sundance ha- has those those filmmaking script writing labs Fukunaga wanted to take par- participate didn't have a script but did have the idea from Victoria Paracino and st- used that as as a basis for the script of Sinombre mm-hmm and yes, Fukunaga lays that out that that is that just shows you how the topic of Mexican American immigration just shows Fukunaga, and Fukunaga just couldn't get away from it. He had to do it. But to me, it actually reads more as an just convenience. Fukunaga wrote Sinombre because he wanted to get into that lab, or he started the process because he wanted to get that sun into that Sundance lab. And what he had as a basis mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, what was his short film. It, it was convenient for him. It was convenient for him. And uh, since there was, as I understood, there was a studio who made the offer that could you please make uh, like a full feature film script for, for this film. And he was like, okay. And yeah, sure, convenient. And uh, he wanted to ma- make a film after all, at least when he was making the short film, he made, wanted to make a film that is tackling some kind of an important societal topic. And he got it here in feature film form. form. And uh, I-, I think it just came on to him. Like, here I have an opportunity to make uh, like a 7 million first uh, uh, feature film of my life. So yeah, of course, I'm not going to say yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even though the subject matter doesn't really uh, concern me that much. I just wanted to make a short film when I was in grad school, and that's it. Yeah, and in in the, the way how I see these events play out, how I see Fukunaga's motives to play out, is that it, it's not just that, it, but it's also kind of a subconscious from Fukunaga's end that he also wants to do a film that tackles that, that only frontier that America anymore has. America truly itself. It no longer has a frontier, not in the, in the sense that it would want to have. It, it has barren places, but th- those are no longer true frontiers. America has been very much tamed. So if, if you are looking at that place, that, that place which, which where the harsh environment tests only the toughest of men and, and which is ruled by savages and cruelty, where violence is the only law, you pretty much the only direction where American filmmakers appear to find that is is from Mexico. Or whenever they go to Mexico, it appears that they are finding precisely that they are finding their magical, you know, hardship land. And I kind of see that 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 feeling that hey, I can find my frontier in Mexico may I also be something that had had played some part in Fukunaka wanting to do Sinombre, wanting to do a film about Mexican immigration, because that would once again mean that, you know, Fukunaka could go to his frontier, play with his savages. So the film ends with the uh, scene, of course, where they are by the river about to cross it, but unfortunately Willie dies because the uh, his ex-gang members track him down, uh, all thanks to well, actually, the aunt of Willie him, himself, which is kind of shocking. You know, first, she is helping them to get on this truck, which has cars on top of it, uh, whatever you call it. And afterwards, he immediately has a call with El Sol, the new boss in town, or in the of the gang. And that leads to the river scene, and uh, Willie is get, get, gets executed, and Smiley gets tattooed on, on his lip, thanks to that. And the horrified lady Saira reaches the U.S., calls the relatives from payphone with a number that was said about goddamn many times in this film. And there we're gonna have it, roll credits with the sad and sudden face of Saira 
or rather relieved face that there's still somebody out there who is alive and that I care about. Any thoughts on that or should we go to the quickies? Not uh, not outside of like how exactly hard is it for two persons to cap, cap the same card then? What, what is a swimming ring that they are use, using? Yeah, one note the about river? that goddamn swimming ring. Why is it used? Or, or moreover, the swimming ring I understand, but what is this dude's function? Like, is he the only I, one I, that ha- can possibly st- touch the bottom of the river? Or what the hell is going on there? I don't know. I, I, I guess he's the only one who can swim. In case something bad happens, or, or something, and you pay for for that, like, it would, eh. yeah, yeah, and and how much do you pay for that? Yeah, like, god, god damn, that those who can swim apparently has a monopoly, right? A perverted swimmer. Yeah, in, instead of in, instead of jo- joining violent drug gang, Casper should have just learned how to goddamn swim. <laughs> Would have made a load of money with that skill. <laughs> Favorite performance. On my end, that goes to Edgar Fo- Flores, who plays Casper. For me, on my end, it would go to Christian Ferrer, Ferrer playing Smiley. For that pretty goddamn good uh, child acting performance. Although, Willy, Willy Wagner was doing Wonderful job as well. Favorite quote. Well, this comes in a small dialogue change between the kids. Uh, One of the Smiley is showing the gun that he has just gotten from the gang leader and is showing it to to this group of young children. One of the kids asks, how many bullets do you have? And Smiley remarks, enough to kill you all. Which... Oh, of course, if if you believe this kid, kid's reaction, you know, horrible death threats on your life are the best of all jokes. Absolutely. On my part, let's just go with Syrah screaming, No! When she's on the river trying to get to the other side or whichever side it is at this, that point. Because I always like those cries of desperation. Yeah, you can see how quotable movie this is for me. <laughs> <laughs> we 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 gonna have to get back back to shlazy pornos and, and bad B movie slashers. No, oh, no, don't like tell that, me that, that. That's the curse. That's the curse of the película. Like you, you, you. Could, we could watch films like I don't know Friday the Thirteenth Part Five, which is a hell of a quotable movie. But instead, we try to watch some kind of a serious cinema here. They indulge in some kino, as, as they say in the internet, and no quotes are to be found. God damn it. No, now thinking about it, I suppose we should have uh, watched the Halloween porn edition instead of Suspiria. Now that you mention it, unfortunately that is a train way too long past. Yep. Maybe next year. But three adjectives to describe the number. Violent, sad, and turbulent. Violent, exhausting, and pleasing. <laughs> that was pulled out of my ass, I, I, I admit, because this is a weekly podcast. Or whatever is my excuse. Would you recommend this film, Henrik? Yes, I would. No? Uh, still. Um, I, I yeah. actually would, would recommend the number. Okay. Okay. It no. is. I'm waiting for this 10 minute explanation why. Well, it <laughs> is. Uh, technically, it's it's pretty well made movie. Like like it's it's not a bad film in in any any meaning. It's it, it's well directed. It's well shot, and your time kind of goes quickly. When wa- wa- watching Sin Nombre, of course, that comes with the notion that. You may have actually seen this film be- before, especially if if you watch, you know, American depictions of of Mexico, and there, there's a lot a lot of things that you may recognize, like you may recognize the cinematography of the film, which is kind of typical to these sort of things. Does 
mostly is just you know kind of, kind of a you know traditional cinematography but every now and then man just pull some really cool and creative shots and it it does also do that that shaky cam thing which gives it documentary feeling meaning that it feels more realistic you may recognize or may have seen that that held back acting that always goes into these things where mm. everything is kind of like my girlfriend just died so i i shed a few tears this this tiny tiny river of tears and don't express it that much i'm not that i, I don't i don't fall to the ground on my knees crying you you may have seen that one that's something that we in the industry we call nuanced it's very nuanced acting you it, it has that you know that the violence is shocking here therefore it's also realistic we even even have the traditional man meat gets thrown to the dog thing going on that's that's also always Or nice implied at least yeah yeah uh of course of course like always like always you also have that one scene that shows kids being kind of uh, incorporated in this cycle of violence you have that indoctrination that happens with child characters but You you have that precise hope for one one scene, and that's never actually, and the film never actually comes back to it. Mm, it mm. it deals with one character, but doesn't come back to the whole group of children being indoctrinated through Smiley. Mm. It's, it's being raised so that the film knows to mention. Yes, I brought it up. That's there. That's good. Uh, like all, like typically, of course, after middle point, there is that moment when character starts to act completely illogically all of a sudden. Like, your main lady here abandons her father, her uncle abandons the agreed, agreed upon route how to get to America, just all of a sudden decides to stick with the violent gangster with no real expo explanation why, but in relation to that, Like well. traditionally, of course, you have the subtle hint that there is a growing affections and romance going on between the lady and the violent gangster. What? It doesn't really come out that strong because, you know, all of that nuanced acting, but it kind of hints into that. And there, there's also, you know, that, that why the romance works thing that usually also is, is, is at play. Once again, the lady sees the gangster do to, to do horrible acts of violence, is drenched in some dude's blood. But the dude was a bad rapist guy, which means that, you know, that violence from Casper's part, it, it was okay and cool and and hot. So the lady is now all wet. So romance most likely happens and the lady screams after Casper. Okay, well, It's a debut mm -hmm. film. I would that, say that's an that's an important film because uh, important point because we always appreciate when we see a debut. That means that we are seeing a coming director blossoming for the first time, and those are moments to be cherished. Yeah, and exactly it, like yeah, the trailer said, from executive producer Diego Luna and Gael Garcia Bernal comes the first film from one of cinema's most exciting new voices. Precisely, precisely, like that. It, that's important. That's hella important when, when you are doing film criticism. And it, it does also enforce the, the whole America's need for the wall because the whole Mexico is a bunch of poor people and drug problems. While it's also showing you some kind of a human side of immigration. So us film critics can kind of stroke our throbbing egos and go about how we are watching artistic films about difficult issues. I watch Sinombre and, mm. and oh boy, the issue has been dropped, raised to the table. Okay. And hey, did, did, you, did, did you notice what we did just now? What? We, we have watched Sinombre and we are talking about it and not talking about Marvel Escape shit. So, mm. you know, hello, film critics. Take notice of us. We also have prestige here we are the kino much the podcast criticism, much talk yeah. shots artsy yeah finish film criticism good talk good talk so overall overall pretty enjoyable film 
four out of five make Mexico pay the theater ticket. Well, here my brother was asking, when are you going to do Wishmaster? So maybe we can go to that direction for balance's sake next time. <laughs> but no, maybe not. We are much, much artsier than that. Are we? We're doing an episode on Hellraiser. Never mind. Um, we, we, are, we are talking about artsy debut, debut film. Yeah, I feel very warm and fuzzy inside talking about Mexican immigrants to the US. Uh, would I yeah. recommend the film? Yes, I would recommend the film. And at one point to your mention about the uh, lady just hopping off the train and leaving uh, the br bros behind. I felt that, that that was like a mixture of emotions and I felt that it was actually believable when you think about how what kind of feelings she is going through. First, there is the safety aspect. I believe that she honestly feels more safe with him, this gangster ma gang member who actually kind of has some experience with violence, could be more plausible guy to protect her in case of violence. Well, most likely it also has some kind of mental health issues. Yeah, yeah. To that violent life he has lived before, but and also has the violent gang hunting him. Yeah, but uh, that is completely the safest no bet. God damn! But this is completely nullified because there is this romance that aspect that as you mentioned. So, kind of the brain part is not taking over here. It's the heart power, and uh, also I think that in some way she feels in indebted to this character because, you know, she was. Her safe well, life was most probably saved by hacking this El, uh, little mago to pieces earlier. So there's that. Yeah, so take a take take a notice, ladies. If you are young and hot, and if you bury a machete into some dude's neck, I will follow you to the ends of the earth. Yep, safety first. <laughs> and yeah, learn that from a Fukunaga feature. <laughs> And of course, there is the point that you raised, I'm repeating about this time once again, but uh, I've seen this before as well, in some sense, Henrik, and uh, like at least 2,500 times. But it works, it's a nice story, little sweet story about uh, violent gang members and uh, not surviving to tell for it to your grandparents. And I think this is a nice uh, realistic touch on it and the camera uh, that they have uh, as the approach to the cinematography, I think it's really... Uh, I think it's uh, exactly what they set out to do, which is that the cinematography is slightly more realistic uh, than it would be in a kind of like a more fantastical story. Even though it's an adventure story, I feel that we are taking a more realistic approach to the camera. That's good. But then it's ending also with the sad tone, sad ending that some people really hate and I actually kind of appreciate it that this is something that might as well happen, especially if you're a gang member who has 25 cars and uh, it goes 500 miles per hour and is uh, able to catch the train. Actually, the train is really slow if it takes two or three weeks to go. So, okay, I understand actually what they were able to catch up. Uh, complete the sentence. You really know you're watching Sin Nombre. When? When you realize that the hugely cumbersome and rusty freight train is still better in staying on the goddamn schedule than your local train operator. Thanks, PR. Ready to crash and burn. We never learn. You really know you're watching Sin Nombre when you witness the harrowing consequences of becoming a free willy. Stay in captivity, people. I guess this is the part where we say goodbye for this week. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Before we do, though, next week's film. What is it, Henrik? I was hoping that we could just skip the question this time. I have no goddamn idea. What are we watching? Well, since we haven't visited outer space for a while, since Dune at least, would you like to watch Outer Space from 1999 by Peter Cherkaski? Uh, this, this sounds like a question which is either a threat or a possibility, so why not? All right. <laughs> Look, this could be one of the most challenging episodes that we're ever going to do, so... No biggie. At least, Henrik, the film is only 10 minutes. I, 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 I smell a trap already. But in terms, terms of research, it, it just might be that you want to watch another film to understand everything. All right. In the meantime, and in the between time, as you can find us on socialistic platforms. And leave us a rating if you feel like it. See you next week. On the other end.
Yeah, so take a take take a notice, ladies. If you are young and hot, and if you bury a machete into some dude's neck, I will follow you to the ends of the earth. Yep. Safety first. And yeah, learned that from a Fukunaka feature. <laughs>